Come on down. I love it. Very good. Very good. And I'll make sure that you get, oh, you got it. Good. I don't know where that came from. I don't know if you made this list. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Let us pray. I am resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though he die. And everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see in my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord. And if we die, we die in the Lord. So then whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord, so it is, says the Spirit. For they rest from their labors. Amen. These are the opening anthems of our pastoral office, right to service of burial. And this begins on page 491. If you want to follow along, I love having printouts, but I had already printed out a form for services, a form for hymns, and I thought, I'm going to save a tree or two and help you all find it in the Red Book of Common Prayer. So page 491 is the service for right to burial of the dead. It is my opinion that the Episcopal Church does this service particularly well. This is where we shine. And I say that because, and I see some heads nodding, that's great. I say that because when somebody comes in to a service here in the Episcopal Church, I have more often heard them as they leave the door saying, that was beautiful. It's beautiful because it holds the grief of death and the hope of the resurrection together. We say, even Jesus wept at the grave of his friend Lazarus. On the back of each of our bulletins, we say, even though this is an Easter liturgy of resurrection, our grief is not unchristian. Our grief is also a beloved part of what we are going through. And I am resurrection and I am life. Death does not get the final word in the Easter liturgy of our burial. So these opening anthems, these opening sentences, set the stage for what we are about. We are here to honor and celebrate the life of someone that we love, the life of someone in our community. We are here to grieve and to honor that in ourselves. And we are here to set our eyes on the fact that we are resurrection people. And you will hear more about that today in Margie's beautiful sermon. So we have all of these things. And as we go through our liturgy, I have put copies of our advanced planning for burial around the room. Now, you might be laughing. I did not come to church today to plan my own funeral. I'm not there yet. Well, I'm not either, but mine's been planned for eight years now. It is on file at Calvary Episcopal. It is on file at St. Paul's Episcopal in Alexandria. And it is on file here at Holy Communion. So no matter where or when I die, somebody's going to figure out what to do. We have a large cabinet in Mary Beth's office of at least 100 pre-plans for funerals here at Holy Communion. You can plan your funeral today. You can, and you can update it anytime you want. I update mine all the time because this is your service. This is your chance to say, these readings mean something to me. These readings are going to bring comfort to my family and friends. These hymns are a part of me. And what greater gift can you give to your family 
that for them to not have to sit there and guess, would they like write one or write two language? Hmm. Well, they kind of went to the 8 o'clock service, but they kind of went to the 1032. I don't know. To say, I want this right one or right two language. To say, I don't know all the music that I want, but I know I want this hymn. Or, I know that I don't want this other hymn that I hear at a lot of funerals. I can tell you right now, Sandy's plan says, no amazing grace whatsoever, never. Okay, maybe not in those words, but he will not have amazing grace at his funeral. And that's important to let your loved ones know. It also gives them a good chuckle when they're going through to plan. So as we go through this, I want you to be thinking, what is it for me? What do I want my funeral to look like? This is not morbid. This is the grace. This is a beauty in what we do. And it really is the greatest gift you can give your family. Because when they are sitting there and they can say, oh, this is what my loved one wanted, then that brings such peace to the whole process. It really does. Um, I'm going to give you suggestions today as we go through, but you can always, always ask questions and say, well, what about this? What about that? If you want to sit down and you say, I know these three things, but I'm not sure about the rest. I want to sit with the clergy and talk about it. We do it all the time. I have planned at least 10 funerals of people who have not yet died here at Holy Communion. Um, Esther Brady comes up to me every single Sunday and says, are you ready? You're doing my funeral. So we do it all the time. You can also, it's just like voting. If you don't know the answer to one of them, you can skip it. You can say, I know that I want communion, but I'm not sure what hymns I want. You can just write in, I want write one with communion, and that's all we have on file, but that's some place to start. So just like voting, you do not have to fill in all the boxes, which, by the way, I hope everyone in here votes. So shameless plug there. Um, so let's start. Uh, we're just going to go through the liturgy, and I'm going to kind of work back and forth between uh, the liturgy and the planning. And um, if you want to fill in as we go and you want to hand it in at the end of class, that's great. If you want to say, okay, I'm going to take it home and fill in some more and bring it back, that's great too. If you want to just take it home and, and do it another day, that's fine too. But we're going to kind of go through and look at this. Um, there are some logistical pieces to what we do here at Holy Communion. One is that we share a campus with a school. So when somebody dies here at Holy Communion, we say, okay, the times we can do services are 11 a.m. or 1 p.m. The reason is we don't want your loved ones fighting carpool. We don't want them having to, and especially this coming year, we don't want them having to fight the carpool line, which is going to be chaos. Uh, and then also uh, we have chapel every single day for St. Mary's, so we need to make sure that we're not on top of them. Um, so those are the, the times that we normally have funerals here at Holy Communion. Uh, we work with all the places around town, and um, Sandy loves to tell the story that uh, he will be at Canale because they know and love Sandy. He had to come down kind of heavily on Memorial Park for scheduling funerals on top of St. Mary's carpool and chapel when he first got here. So when he goes into Memorial Park, they say, hello, Father Sandy. When I go into Memorial Park, it's, Hester, how are you doing? Because I got to be the good cop. Um, I also have a nickname at Memorial Park. They call me Seven Minutes. And the reason they do this is that the first funeral Sandy ever gave me on my own was somebody who had moved away years ago but had wanted her funeral back here at Holy Communion. And her daughter came to me and said, okay, I'm just going to shoot you straight here. The longer the pallbearers are in the same room, the more chance you have of a fist fight. Went, great, God, you've got a wonderful sense of humor here. So she wanted the shortest of everything. I think the psalm had three verses. I think there was one reading. There was no music. We got through that service so fast, and Memorial Park, they said they barely had time to pee before the service was over to get back in to carry the casket out. So you can make a service whatever you want it to be. 
Um, most are much longer than seven minutes, but if you need that, there was no fist fight until the reception, but that was Memorial Park's problem. Um, most are, are much more delightful than that, but if you go to Memorial Park and you say Hester, they'll go, ha ha, seven minutes. <laughs> so, um, on page 491 and 92, we've already gone through the opening anthems. Um, again, just such a beautiful way to introduce what we're doing here, our Easter liturgy. And then, if you are um, having a service for an adult, uh, you've got several to choose from. Um, I normally choose this one on 493 at the bottom. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brother or sister. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Again, in that one prayer, you see those who mourn and life, gate of life eternal, until we're reunited. So it holds those two things in such beautiful balance. Um, at the burial of a child, if you turn the page, you'll see that one. O oh God, whose beloved son took children into his arms and blessed them, give us grace to entrust to your never-failing care and love and to bring us all to your heavenly kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now you get to the liturgy of the word. Our burial liturgy is a lot like that of a Sunday in that you have lessons. And here, what I love about our prayer book is it gives us kind of cliff notes right here. You look, and you don't have to have Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm, and Gospel. In fact, most don't. If you are having communion, which there is no right or wrong answer to having communion, it's like weddings. We do about half of each. Generally, a family will say, if they have a lot of Episcopal family and friends, they'll have communion. If they feel like that would be difficult and confusing for half the people there, they, they say, well, that might not be the best time for that. So it, there's no right or wrong to it. Um, but if you're having communion, you do need to have a gospel lesson. And otherwise, you've just got free reign. And these are wonderful examples of readings that work well in a burial liturgy because if I were to say to you oh pick a reading that you think will be good you'd probably be like where do I start what works well in this liturgy and they not only give you the passage they give you a little hint at which one that is so if you say oh I want that one about in my dwell you know in thy heaven their dwelling places something like that you can look down here and you will see that in the gospel John 14, 1 to 6, in my Father's house there are many rooms. I go before you to prepare a dwelling place. So you can kind of say, oh, I, I kind of remember that, but I don't fully. And you can go down here and maybe figure it out. Otherwise, you can go. There's a wonderful lectionary page.net out of Vanderbilt. You can actually go to uh, this part on the home page and click on burial, and it'll give you the full text of all of these online. Or we also have copies here at the church. So if you ever wanted to request one, it's a long packet, so I didn't want to print out a ton of them. But if you ever want to say, can I see that packet? Or can you email it to me? We can do that, and it has a full text of all these readings. Now, I personally am going to have a gospel reading that is not in here. So I'm saying that to say it is okay to choose a reading that is not in this list. Um, you might not want to choose David and Bathsheba, which we'll hear today. That might not be the best one to choose for your burial. But I'm going to choose you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. It was read at my christening, it was read at my wedding, and it will be read at my funeral. So there are other lessons that you can choose from these. And you can say, I want two epistles. 
You can say, I want a psalm, or I want one of the psalms that's set to a hymn tune that everyone can sing together. After the readings, um, everyone uh, reaffirms their faith, page 496. The Apostles' Creed may then be said, in the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say, and everyone says that together. What a wonderful time to reaffirm your faith. The time when my faith was shaken the most was when my first friend died. So to have that opportunity in a service to get up and say, I believe in God even though I don't understand what's going on right now, even though I'm angry, even though I'm sad, even though I see this whole resurrection thing, but I'm just not feeling it today. You can get up and you can reaffirm your faith in your community that's going to get you through this. You can say it together. Here, if you do not have communion, you go ahead and say the Lord's Prayer as well. Always, always so comforting to have that, that prayer of community, of faith. So you say that together. Otherwise, you'll say it in the Eucharistic prayer as we normally do. And then we have the prayers of the people. So on Sundays, we pray for all in the world. We pray for government. We pray for nations. We pray for those who are grieving. We pray for those on our prayer list, everyone. At weddings, you pray specifically for the couple you've come together for. And at funerals, you come and you pray for those who have died and those who are grieving them. And it's a beautiful way of joining in prayer. I'll read a couple that always stand out to me. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for this person and dry the tears of those who weep. We acknowledge that we are grieving. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. You raised the dead to life. Give our sister eternal life. Again, eternal life next to our grief. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. And we go forward from there. These are beautiful prayers, and I commend them to you anytime uh, to read. And then at the end, on page 498, Father of all, we pray to you for this person and for all of those who we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May their souls and the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Again, we do this well. These words, just straight to your heart. Um, we either go forward with the Eucharist at this part, or we go to the commendation. Different churches have different traditions around this. Some only do the commendation when there is a body present. Uh, Sandy and I and, and Randy, we do a commendation, whether it is a funeral, a memorial service, whether there's a casket, ashes, or no body at all. Uh, we do this because, again, the language is so beautiful, and it gives us a chance to commend this loved one to God. It is such, um, I think for us, a piece of the liturgy we don't want to let go of. Um, and I'll just read to you a little bit of this. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, and we name them. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him or her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. I just picture that, the glorious company of the saints in light. 
It's a beautiful image. There's also, if you turn to 501, you'll see the committal. The committal are the prayers that we say at the graveside um, or in the memorial garden when we're commending the ashes to the earth. Um, for those of you who don't know, we have uh, places in our memorial garden in the wall that you can, be, um, you can have as a container. We also have a scatter garden underneath the large tree. And our policy here at Holy Communion is that anyone who wants to be in our scatter garden, free of charge, free of anything, anyone can be in that scatter garden. And it's dust to dust, ashes to ashes. What a wonderful way of kind of becoming a part of new life. And so we have the committal. Um, also, there are oftentimes when somebody has a funeral in one location and is buried in another city. Uh, just two weeks ago, um, I don't know uh, if you all knew Hal Canary. He was a member here of Holy Communion. A long time ago, he retired to Florida, uh, or he went to work in Florida and then retired in North Carolina. So his funeral was in North Carolina, but I did the committal here at Memorial Park so that he could be buried with his family. So it's wonderful that we have a service that can stand alone so that those who gather in maybe a hometown can also honor the life, and their commending of the Spirit. So we have that. Now, another part of all of this is music. And so I have David here on the front row, um, ready to share his uh, wonderful experience. But you'll also see around the room, there is a list of suggested hymns from the hymnal 1982 for the burial of the dead. Uh, these are suggested again, okay? So it's not saying you must choose these at these places. But a lot of times what I'll hear as I sit down with a family is, where do I even start? I mean, what is going to work well in this? So this gives you a wonderful list of hymns that work really well in certain parts of the liturgy. Your renegade priest, again, is using a hymn that's not even on this list. But these are wonderful, wonderful suggestions for where to start. David, do you want to say a couple of words about your experience as people go to look at music? Um, here, we're going to do this. I'm going to turn mine off so we don't get... Hello? Hello? We don't have microphones at the organ console, so the clergy are better at this than I am. <laughs> um, I have had a number of parishioners in 18 years come to my office and say, I want to plan the music for my funeral. Well, they don't say that. They say, I want to plan my funeral. And so, you know, they'll have a list of four hymns or 25 hymns. And somewhere between the four and the 25, we can figure out how many we can put into one liturgy. Um, that is always a privilege for me because people want to get it right. Uh, others have come to me and said, I love trumpet and organ recordings. I want to hire a trumpeter. That was Charles Krigman, I mean, um, um, Charles Crump. So, um, you know, you can write all of that. So I am always glad to start in my office if the music is that important. You know, a lot of people, they'll think about the, I don't want to rain on your parade, but they'll think about the scripture lessons later because the music is so important to them. So we start in my office and then complete the music part, but then I send them on to the clergy of their choice uh, to complete the, the process as well. So it, it really is a privilege, and um, I've done it a lot. So uh, I would be happy to do that again. So, And I don't want the 23rd Psalm it's the first one I learned. I have heard it all my life. On the fourth Sunday of Easter, I can plan an entire service with five hymns that are paraphrases of the 23rd Psalm and an anthem that is the 23rd Psalm and the appointed 23rd Psalm. So I want Psalm 121, and that's written on my plan. So That's great. Oh, you have a question. Oh, no, not at all, not at all. These are good suggestions, and you'll notice, and Hester mentioned this, the, the distinctive thing of the Anglican burial rite, in my opinion, 
is the trajectory or the arc. You start with these beautiful, comforting scripture verses quietly, and you end with the biggest Easter hymn that is your favorite hymn, or Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, or some other hymn like that. But um, you, uh, I think Be Thou My Vision is one of the ones suggested for Between the Lessons, you go either way at the offertory. You know, uh, Jesus Christ is risen today, I think, is listed at the offertory, but you can go either way. Um, but we do a goodly number of funerals where we go out singing, The Strife is O'er, or Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, or whatever. So, no, no but you can have whatever hymn. Sandy does not want Amazing Grace, uh, but he does want uh, For All the Saints. All eight verses. We are not to cut one of them. It's his favorite hymn. We sang it on his first Sunday here. He's the first one to line up for even uh, for all saints. So, um, as I said, you you just will notice the character of the hymns there, and you can do. You don't have to do one like "Be Thou My Vision" between the lessons. It just is nice to do that in that place because it, it doesn't really take away from the lessons, I guess. But I, I see a trajectory in, the, in our burial office to a big Easter hymn. <laughs> Secular music. Um, uh, we, that's sacred. Where we draw the line is it has to be, I, I, the language somewhere is um, texts from the Book of Common Prayer or the Holy Bible or the 1985 hymnal, I mean, 82 hymnal, or texts congruent with them. So we don't, we don't pull the plug on something like the saints go marching in, but uh, we've only just begun, would need to be done at, done at the reception. So... If we're talking about lovey-dovey love and not God's love, we right, right. But the, it's the text we look at that that dictates to us the music. It's not the style of music that dictates. And I had no clue that Molly even liked the 530 service or ever attended it until she came and met with me. And so we had all Celtic music for that service. Yes, but yes, but I'd rather somebody show up in my office and say, you know, I love the Celtic service and I love... Will you come and follow me and let's sing that? So. We have a thurible in this building. We haven't used it for a number of years. I'll tell you privately why later. Um, we do entrance hymns. Sandy and I call those state occasion funerals. And Sandy and I differ on this. This is the beautiful thing about having a relationship with your rector like I presently have, because we can sit down and disagree. Um, I think having a big, loud presentation hymn really takes away from the beauty of the quiet entrance rite that our prayer book dictates. Um, others want to come in to a big, loud hymn like we do on Sunday morning, and that's okay, too. So if it's a state occasion funeral and you just have to have joyful, joyful, or for all the saints or whatever, we do that. But um, an incense, I'll talk to you privately about. I have 18 years of experience. Thank you. <laughs> we, can, uh, we can also, you know, if you put on there, you can also put like, well, we're going to look at the sheet a little bit too. Um, 
if you've got one of these near you, and I've got plenty more of them, and they're kind of around the room, if you look at it, you can see um, just some questions that are helpful. These are questions that tend to be the first questions a family asks. So again, it's like voting. You don't have to know all the answers to these, but if you have an idea, always better to write down, I love Celtic music, than nothing. Okay, so even if you don't know that part and you haven't met with David, that's okay to at least get us started. Um, you know, it says, I prefer to have my burial service take place at Holy Communion or another place. Um, if my uh, generations of my family have been buried in LaGrange, I might say, well, my church home is Holy Communion, but I want my service in LaGrange like my mother and grandmother and great-grandmother had. Uh, that helps us figure that out. Um, also, uh, you can have, um, I prefer the burial office with prayers and hymns and lessons only, or I prefer it with communion. Again, there is no right or wrong answer to this. It's what works best for you and for your family and friends. Um, communion, though, gives you the ability to have more music. Uh, you can also look at these scripture lessons and fill in which ones stand out to you, you can always say, I love these two gospel lessons and I want my family to choose. That's okay too. You, don't, you can give more information than what we need because uh, again, it's just to help navigate that um, when we get to that point. Um, also, or I prefer scripture lessons and hymns to be chosen by my family in consultation with clergy. Uh, you, can, you can leave it there. If you have ideas for pallbearers, lectors, chalice bearers, clergy, or others, you can fill that in, but you don't have to. We always have a list of people who serve in those capacities, and we can always um, call on them. They're all active in, uh, in this community of faith. Uh, but, you know, for instance, you can put, I want CHC clergy. Because there's a good chance that a lot of us have quite a while to live, and you're not sure who the rector of Holy Communion is going to be at that point. You don't know. I mean, we have, Ollie must have done a wonderful formation piece on this, because I have more forms that say I want Ollie Rencher to do my funeral. Well, you know, Grace St. Louis is going to want him some too. So uh, you can always put, if, you know, these are some names, or CHC clergy, or my cousin who's a pastor in Houston, you know, who's at an, another place. So you can put those down, and we're always willing to uh, do the best that we can. Um, you know, the best thing is if you outlive all of them. Uh, you also have, uh, I would prefer for my family to do that piece. Uh, if you know where you're going to be buried, it helps to have it down here, because usually the first place that a funeral home does they call us or we call them to make sure that we're all on the same page so that Memorial Park doesn't put a three o'clock funeral and then everyone's stuck in carpool madness. Um, you can also additional information. It kind of helps us to uh, go through that with your, um, with your family and your friends uh, you can talk about uh, estate planning. You can talk about any other helpful information, things like that. My mom has a prayer that was printed on the back of my grandmother's funeral. Uh, Do not stand at my, way, my grave and weep. It's a beautiful poem. Uh, she's basically just attached that to her planning so that that's easy to find because she wants that on her bulletin uh, for her service as well. Yes, Nat. Yes. In the Episcopal Church, theologically, there is no right or wrong answer to cremation or bury the body or scatter at sea or any of that. Um, I will be cremated. My family has uh, niches in the wall of the columbarium at Calvary. And we actually already have the containers as well. Mimi Dan made beautiful pottery containers uh, that fit in those niches. Um, it, one of them's holding pasta in my parents' kitchen right now. I'm just telling you all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, so there is no right or wrong to that in the Episcopal Church. Randy, do you want to speak to that at all, too? Do you have any? 
Yeah. It is a personal decision. Um, you know, in the Jewish tradition, they're, they're very um, disciplined about saying, you know, within 24 hours and, and all of that. And, you know, each faith has their own um, views of that. But uh, I will say one thing related to that is that we do not do open casket in the Episcopal Church. Um, that is one thing. If you want it in the visitation at the funeral home, that's fine, but we don't do because in the Episcopal Church, we put a pall, a covering over every coffin, and because no matter whether you have the Cadillac version of a coffin or the pine box version, uh, everyone is the same in the eyes of the Lord, and we cover that with a pall. Yes, Neil. How does the timing work? That's a good question. Um, oftentimes, we are waiting to hear back from the funeral home if the body has been cremated yet, and that helps us to plan when the funeral can happen. Um, it does take time, and depending on the time of the year, um, around Thanksgiving, they get pretty backed up. It, a range is usually three to four days. Is that about right? About three to four days that, that they'll say, yeah, yeah, at, at the range is usually three to four days. Um, but sometimes when it's, especially, at, at the nursing home will say, if the angel train comes through and picks up a lot of new passengers, you might have a little bit longer. And that's something that we have a lot of, um, a lot of experience with. But, you know, one of the things that Sandy loves to say is we, we set a funeral if a person has died. Because um, we actually have a lot of people saying, like, I want to schedule the funeral for next Wednesday. They've got 24 hours. And it, we have no way of predicting that. You know, we have a lot of advances in medicine, but that is one that we cannot call. So, uh, you know, you must be born to get baptized. You must die to, to get the time and date of your funeral. <laughs> yeah, very good questions. Other questions? This is good. Yes, Phil. So, uh, eulogies, right? So, if somebody getting up and giving a reflection. Um, I'll tell you, we often discourage eulogies for the reason that we would like for those who are closest to the person who we're honoring to have that chance to grieve. And it is hard to get up in a service and to talk about a loved one. Um, it's hard to be fully present with your own grief during that time if you're getting up to speak. However, um, there is a place that we can make it work um, if, you know, if somebody feels very strongly about that. I often do it if, if I don't know the person being buried and somebody says, I really want to give a few remarks. I feel like that helps round out to really honor that person's life. Um, but it needs to be somebody you know will have that inner strength and composure to get up there and be able to do that. Because I love for people to be able to be present in their emotions. And that's just a lot to ask of somebody. Um, clergy are, are trained to compartmentalize at times like this. But even sometimes for me, it's hard. Um, now, with that said, I did get up and, and do the homily for my uncle's funeral. And somehow the Holy Spirit gave me that grace. And I was able to get through it. So I'm not saying it's not possible. I just always like to ask those questions. Um, there's also oftentimes people will do a visitation before or after in the parish hall, and uh, there's time for that as well, or sometimes sitting around the living room as family and being able to give time for those stories uh, can be such a beautiful um, moment of grace for families at that time. Dottie. Sound for funerals? Yes. Right, right. 
different places, different regions, and different churches have different traditions around this. Um, the, here, we feel very strongly that uh, one of our clergy will give a homily, and that will be, you know, not just, it's not, because there are two things going on here. There's honoring the person's life, and there's honoring the hope of resurrection and the good news in this. And so we want to make sure that, um, that both are attended to. Um, oftentimes, we know the person uh, well. They're part of our extended family, too, so we can do that. And if we can't, you're right. I mean, it's wonderful to have that, that verbal tribute during a service. That's why we don't say never. I mean, obviously, we don't, we don't say that you cannot. Um, we just like to ask those important questions to make sure that, um, that we're continuing to hold those things in balance, that we're continuing to honor where everyone is during that time, and, uh, and every family can figure out what works best for them. Um, but oftentimes, uh, you know, even if we don't know the person really well, we sit around with the family and hear the stories and can often bring those to light in our homilies as well. What else? Oh, there's also, you mentioned a clip about Billy Crystal giving remarks at Muhammad Ali's. Uh, there's another phenomenal YouTube clip that I recommend to all of you. Google New Zealand um, caskets. New Zealand ladies and caskets. And you are going to find the most beautiful movement happening in the Anglican community in New Zealand. Have you seen this? It's so great. They are saying, okay, we're tired of our families having to pay thousands of dollars for caskets. And we want this to be a happy time. They get together and they paint their own caskets. And they're beautiful. They are. They have sunflowers and glitter and bling and verses and they just come together as a community and this is a way of celebrating that death does not get the final word this is a joyous time too because we are entering into eternal life with God so look that up you are just gonna love it I the first time I watched it I was just crying I was laughing so hard and you know I think that's it whenever we're in this moment I think Sandy said this so beautifully at Jackson's service but Tears and laughter are so close in our souls. So times of funerals can be so beautiful and filled with those stories of, of reminiscing and laughter and humor. So you're laughing one second and, and bawling the next because it's that we are so grateful to have had this time with this loved one and we're going to miss them. And that's okay. So I love that our service honors that we are going to be joyful and we are going to cry. And both are a part of this beautiful passage for someone. Any final question? Yes, Connie. Very good. We are always looking for people who are willing to help usher and serve. We are always looking. If you feel like you have some flexibility during the weekday, uh, you know, just say, I would love to learn how to help serve at a funeral. You don't have to be a regular Sunday usher or lector or, um, you know, to to say I want to help serve at a funeral. We will train you up. We'll get you there. Um, and what a great way to, to honor our community and to help keep us going. Yeah. Yeah. Visitation is always such a wonderful time to gather. And for those of you who don't know, Connie does such a gift for all of us in helping us to have that space and that time and that set up for visitation and receptions here in the parish hall. And that's always um, a, an invitation for everyone. Um, so that will conclude today. But I say that in that this is the beginning 
of a process, and you all can call us anytime, call David, call the clergy, and we will help you get this. If you have uh, forms that you've filled out, just bring them on up to me, and I'll make sure they get into Mary Beth's uh, special fireproof safe. And if you want to drop them by at any time, uh, you can do that. Just drop them by the church office, and we would love to keep that on file for you. Again, even if you only know a few of the pieces, um, then that's always a gift that you can leave your family. And even at the grave, we make our song, Alleluia, 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 Amen.